final meeting of our two days story tank. So we are here uh, this afternoon with, this, with Sama Karaki, a doctor in neuroscience who explores our creative possibilities and the narratives that limit and sometimes endanger them. Tamara Russell, uh, also doctor in neuroscience and martial arts expert who develops new models of collective creation and mindful decision making. Jan Schomburg is a film and series screenwriter, film director, and writer. And this year, we also wanted to invite women and men who experience firsthand the impact of stories in our lives. Their place in our communities puts them at the heart of the issues of care and the protection of others. And uh, this is how we have the pleasure of welcoming Thomas Rose, osteopath and professor of osteo osteo osteopathy? Osteopathy. 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 So um, maybe we could um, return to what Sama was saying, and you were alluding to as well, which is the way we uh, each and individually uh, perceive this illusionary world and um, respond to it in um, uh, non aware ways. We haven't uh, explored that more, let's say, um, physiological level, even though I know you're, you're, well, you're both working on the limits of that discourse, but how is it that we are wired in a way that we respond, react, and think without us even knowing that we're doing that? And from there, maybe move on to the ways in which we can work against that. And, uh, Sama, would you, could you speak to yeah. us about that? Right now we are all doing lots of physiological mechanisms in a very automatic way. You're not aware that you're breathing. Actually, you're surviving each other's second. You know, you're, oh, you're about to die and then you breathe and you're alive again. So you're, and you're doing this because you are kind of relying on this automatic, this autonomous nervous system that is like telling you, I'm taking care of digesting your food and maintaining your body temperature and fighting any, you know, like stranger germ coming into your body so that you can listen to these people talking, right? So you are, you are available to do something else. So your executive system is, uh, is not worried, not preoccupied by all of these issues, right? So what's amazing in our brain that um, not only our uh, survival <laughs> issues are automatic, but also everything that you've been through. Mm. Uh, the language I'm using, I'm not born speaking English, and so at some point I had to automatize this language so that I can go beyond the, the, the symbols and, I, and, and you know, bring meaning to what I'm saying. The way we walk, the way we sit, um, everything you're doing right now is actually, you're not processing it actively. So we need to be first grateful to have a system that is allowing us to be available to do something else. So we, re we rely on this automatic system because we don't have enough energy to process the world every, every time we look at it. But bias is actually when this system fails. It is because, like, I don't know you, but I, we've been a few hours together, but I already judged you based on my automatic um, cultural, social experience, uh, past experiences of people that look like you, that behave like you, right? So I need sometimes to say, actually, I don't know you. And I, I know that I'm having this because I'm having this judgment automatically. But I need also to accept that you are an ambiguous object. And that I don't know, yeah. But it's, it's not okay for me to accept this for everybody here because it's, it's such a cognitive load to accept the ambiguity of the world and the uncertainty of the world. So I don't want to sound like other neuroscientists asking people to have critical thinking and you know, to always think against ourselves with this metacognitive issue because we don't have enough energy for that. But if I want to delve into a creative process, then I must be doing what you talked about, Jan, is I need to fight against my urge to describe the world the way I see it. It's actually to forget about myself, which is kind of impossible, but we tend towards this. And 
maybe um, a trick that we can have is instead of me doing this work alone, is to question you who you are. <laughs> you know, instead of me yeah. saying, you know, it's to, and that's how it becomes collective narrative creating. Because I am actually accepting to hear your perspective and to give it the same exact place I give it to my interpretation of what you are. And also another trick would be to share experiences, because the more experiences we share, the, the, the richer my interpretation of who you are becomes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Tamara, <laughs> yes. I think the, the phrase that comes to my mind is unlearning. And that doesn't mean throwing learning out, but it's recognizing that in that learning journey from this big, wide, open eyes of a child funneled into society, status, education, career, expertise, tribe, you know, there's a narrowing. And, and that makes things more efficient. It allows us to take advantage of automaticity. But maybe we reach a certain time in our lives when we realize that unlearning is going to bear more fruit. And this is perhaps when you know, my approach is mindfulness-based ways of, of trying to open up the thinking to enrich the memory banks with, with kind of new information and to maintain an awareness of you know, more than just what's on my mind. So it was interesting as you were talking, I was thinking, oh, I am actually aware of my breath and I am kind of tuned into my posture, <laughs> but I didn't used to be, yeah. you know, and it's through training and, you know, I would encourage those there, like, let's tune into our posture. Yes, the brain is really awesome and is helping us to maintain relatively upright posture. But anybody who's worked at a computer for a long time, you know, the posture will go like this. And then it's like, okay, how can I maintain that awareness of my body, keep that bodily information flowing into my brain, allow my decision making and creative process to draw on all sources yeah. of information. And I mean, just also to follow up one other point which we could pick up, which is for me, what's been really helpful is really keeping an eye out for the I know mental monkey. So the minute I think I know, it's not to dismiss the things I know, but it's to then know <laughs> that that's a moment to just be careful. Yeah. Because there's a neural pathway that's getting ready to fire, <laughs> that is smooth and deep and easy. It's like being on the autobahn. And actually, there might be something more fruitful if I get my machete and I go this path that isn't well trodden. There's another point I think maybe you would like to react to I found, find really interesting is what you were saying about uh, not going along with certain voices in the neurosciences that say you must work against yourself and, and not sharing to this sort of negative uh, vision that reintroduces also, it seems to me, judgment and uh, a false sense of effort. And I'm thinking of that as, uh, as a writer and in the way that we all, all, I think, all too often also think, I must fight against myself, or I mean, to be in that sort of... Um, Christian uh, relationship to uh, yeah, and so I, w I wondered what you what your thoughts were about that. Yeah, I can do a hand gesture that maybe might yeah. help to to elaborate that. So, so kind of here is our our thought stream just going along, and mostly our whole awareness is captured by that. We're not even aware that we're thinking, we're just kind of in a thinking process. Then we have this op opportunity to create the dyad of subject and, and object. So it's like, oh, here is a thought, and here is a something that knows it's thinking. Homo sapiens sapiens. And so what you've now got is a relationship. 
and you've got options and please jump in if this isn't correct but you know if I think about techniques like CBT CBT then says get back in there but I want you to figure out why this thought is wrong and I want you to be like a legal person and say, no, that's not right, no, that's not, it's a bit hardcore, I'm what exaggerating. Is what is CBT? Cognitive behavioral therapy. Oh, yeah. So restructuring thoughts with a kind of arguing method mm. versus in a more mindful, compassionate mode, yes, there's the effort of, of being aware of the thought, but we're alert, but relaxed. Not alert, 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 relax. And we say, wow, look at that mind go. Isn't that interesting? All my prejudice, all my judgment. Oh gosh, that's a really big judgy, judgy. I don't go, no, you shouldn't judge and you're bad to judge and you're a naughty person. I just go, wow, how I judge, how I judge. So the quality there is alert, but relaxed and our modern society really likes alert alert because it feels like we're doing something and the secret is alert relaxed Jan I mean do you deal with some automatized Jans and uh, within yourself and yeah, yeah, yeah. and how do you relate to that in your work yeah. Well, the, the, I, I feel very connected, of course, what uh, Tamara just said, because this is, um, for me, like, you know that as a writer, you have to be in a flow. I mean, it has to, like, at some point you have to let go, and you have to give yourself to the universe, and you have to be in a connection. And then you are just uh, like a helpless little thing that, that just gets thoughts. But before that, you, I, I also feel you're, you're building, like, uh, little hatch little you know rivers where you can then flow um so you do build those little rivers in which to flow absolutely yes. because for me uh, the bartleby thought i prefer not to is uh, in writing very very important because of course i very much the first impulse of doing something is also really bad so so it's it's mainly also decide to decide oh this comes from, I've seen this in other movies, or this is like a bad idea. <laughs> so yeah, I, f I, feel, I feel very close to that, uh, to that, to that thought of um, watching from above and then, but also being inside at the same time uh, while writing. Sama, on this point of effort versus effortlessness, work versus flow. I believe it works. I feel I've never done the experience of it, but I, let's say I belong to a um, school of thought that like, would defend another way of dealing with ourselves and would, would consider that we don't have as much willpower as we think we do, that we don't have any, that actually we it's not like that we're determined, determined, we're determined by our past experiences. Mm. But that actually that our, um, this metacognitive, this, you know, me looking at myself, I believe it's more efficient when it's done by others, when I'm allowing others mm. to, to let, let, let them show me how they see what I'm, what I'm looking at. So I believe also mental health is an issue of the quality of interactions we have with others, but also, our self-discourse and our sense of who we are and what we are, how, why we are doing the things we are doing them. I think it's better to just enrich the pool of experiences that we have with others' experiences. So I'm kind of doubt <laughs> about how energy left for us to do that kind of training. Um, that is, you described it as this Judeo-Christian way of, uh, of uh, considering this alertness that, is, that takes effort and energy. And I'm more interested in looking at people as they flow. And I say, actually, they're flowing and they don't have energy and time to stop and look at themselves. And this is very luxurious to do this. Maybe I could, but I'm interested 
and people who do not have that energy. So how can we create default environments where, where actually what I'm seeing is complex, where I am uh, facing uh, the limits that I have in my perceptions with the complexity of the perceptions of others. So if, if I think, for example, education, education that is based on willpower, on the illusion of willpower, and that's why is it interesting to fight for social mixity? It's because when I'm, when I'm actually experiencing learning with others, that I, I am kind of unconsciously, in a very implicit ways, um, learning that the world is complex. When we speak different languages, we are not saying, oh, this could be called cup and kbeye and ver. I just know it that truth can be called differently. So I, I think that we should reflect on environments and social connections to develop critical thinking instead of relying on the individual effort. Oh, there is something that I guess we can, we can connect with that Jan was uh, talking about. I guess there are some collective intelligence. We are all the time talking about your intelligence, my intelligence, the artificial intelligence, and we forgot a collective intelligence who can be done that way to fight against, because it's so easy to be machist, machist? so easy to be racist, it's very, very easy. It's the first, many times, it's the first reaction. It's so easy and we have to listen and to create a collective intelligence, no? Yes, and totally. I mean, like, if, if let's say we are, we are going through, like, and uh, let's discover our racial biases, you know, and prejudice. Well, you can, you can say, yeah, I just had a racist thought. You're not going to change it. You, know, you, you don't have the ability to go inside your habit system and say, I'm not going to smoke anymore. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to do sports in the morning. But your brain says, I, I like those ideas, but we don't have energy to change that. But when, when does it become interesting? When we are actually faced with the diversity of others, because my friends are diverse, because the people I love are diverse. I don't have even to question my biases. I'm actually building better automatisms. And this is something that we reflect on collectively. The how do we build districts? How can we, how we reflect on, on the urban landscape? How do we make, uh, the, how do we imagine narratives that we share with others? And this is maybe the responsibility uh, of uh, when we write. It's about making it possible to show the complexity of the reasons why people do what they do. And I, I, I've read this sentence lately, it's Sarah Schulman, she's a writer, called Conflict is Not Abuse, which is like an amazing book about empathy and about understanding that people, even when they seem monsters to us, well, they are not sleeping and the, you know, and at night saying, I'm a bastard. They're also sleeping saying, I've done the best that I could do. And to, to really acknowledge that People always have very good reasons to believe what they believe in and to behave the way they believe. I would, please, um, I, would I wish to, before we move into, or, or go deeper into those collective environments and the very central uh, issue of empathy that we, we would like to discuss, uh, if, if Sama, you could just say a little more about what you call this illusion of willpower, because not many people, people who've read you will know or heard you, but, and also, and then maybe I would, I would love to hear Tamara about this, maybe this, how do you distinguish between energy and willpower? Because I think those are very vital concerns to writers too. Yeah, like in the neuroscience field already have, um, position uh, regarding this idea of, of, of willpower and free will, yes. showing from a neuroscientific perspective, I mean experiments done in a laboratory that are not close to be as complex as what we actually experience as decision making in our actual life. But it shows that even when we believe that I decided to say something or to, to, to behave or to move my hand, 
the brain already processed this information and took the decision in a very implicit way, based on my past experiences, again, and not my ancestors guiding me or whatever. It's based on my past, so I'm determined by my past experiences. And what comes after is my, uh, my consciousness uh, rationalizing the decision that I've, took, that, that I've taken. But then again, uh, this is the context of the laboratory experiments. It doesn't, it's not as common. So we talk about free want and not free will because it's, I, I can observe my saying, myself uh, on, the, on the verge of saying something that I refuse to say it, which my, my, my seven-year-old kid, they, he, sometimes he wants to, to, you know, to say a big word, <laughs> and then he stops himself. So he's, he's, he's doing this free want. But we have to remember that this is costly takes energy, so we can experience it from time to time. We all experience some kind of, uh, of you know, like of willpower against ourselves. But we don't have to fall into the illusion that this work is continuous and it's it's a luxurious work. It's something that takes lots of energy and lots of willing to accept that we're wrong. Which is also, again, something because we are more attached to the feeling of coherence. And that's, that's why, by the way, algorithms of social media are built. Be, are built the way to, to nourish this need by creating the filter bubbles where you are actually only meet the information that you already agreed on. Because we don't want you to spend a bad time looking at your social, <laughs> social media wall. So I'm going to make you see uh, what you already know and like. And that's how we end up saying, I don't understand people who, right? It's because uh, you believe that they have willpower hmm. to decide on their decisions and actions again. And they are actually living in the same, uh, the same nature of this bubble that are completely confirming what they have already as ideas and perceptions. Thank you. Tamara. In terms of, of the energy, um, I mean, I, I may not have understood you correctly, but this idea that, you know, well, it's a luxury to be able to train your brain. I mean, I'll just give you an example of how I might work, which is if I want my mind to be alert, relaxed, I make my body alert, relaxed. <laughs> That's it. I've just, I've just done a practice. I'm, pra I'm practicing now. I've adjusted my body to be alert and relaxed in a way well, but test it and I, I, see. It was not my will, it just happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but explore, right? Experiment. Yeah, yeah. How, how is my thinking when I'm like this? How, how is my thinking when I'm like this? And for me, it's really different. You know, so, so I get that we've got various ways of training in mindfulness, but my own kind of unique variant of that is we do it every day, we do it in every movement, Bruce Lee style, picking up the shopping, putting on a jacket, you know, hashtag no cushion, we can do it in ways that are accessible to everybody. You know, even a busy working mom or a health professional or someone in a psychotic break. Mm. Like that, you know, that, that's been my journey. How do we do it for those people? Mm. I'll say we... one more comment about yes, the please. energy. And, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll draw maybe now more from a martial arts perspective. Um, Jan was talking about that moment when you kind of surrender to the universe. And I suppose in, in martial arts, and particularly in Qigong, which is the more um, healing, energetic aspects of, of martial arts, we talk about two different kinds of qi. So if you're going to a Qigong master, there'll be one kind of Qigong master who is using their own qi to heal. There's another kind of master that it's almost like channeling. They remove themselves from the equation. They remove their egoic self from the uh, equation in order to open to what they would call the universal chi. And at that point, the cosmos is doing the healing and the human is merely a vehicle. So maybe the inquiry is, what is the role of surrender? Mm. What is the role of surrendering? What is the role of surrendering, uh, well, Jan Schomburg? Me, I guess because it's your turn now. <laughs> or tell us how maybe you've been taking care of yourself, because this is also an issue we had yesterday, and an issue we all have as writers also. 
Have you been taking, taking care of your chi, of your energy, of your willpower, of your, of your body? Of, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know. I, 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 uh, I, I have Ritalin. Uh, which is a really good drug to focus um, and I, I got a psychiatrist uh, prescribed it to me uh, and it's, I take a very very little dose but it's very very pleasant because it uh, you all love that right? Yes. Oh I can see her face um, uh, and apart from that of course um, um, I would, I would like to, uh, joyfully and ve vehemently disagree to you when you say uh, that it costs a lot of energy um, to go into this meta perspective. If I understood you right, and it, that it's a luxurious thing, I, th I have the feeling I see it in every kind of culture. I see certain people who have this ability, and or some have also learned it. But I, for myself, can say, if I have to engage all the time in my thoughts and I cannot go uh, let them pass or I cannot learn, oh, this is why I'm thinking that right now, but I don't have to fire it up. I can just leave it. So, but maybe we are not, I'm talking about something else, am I? No, we're talking about the same exact thing and that's why it's your job. Yes. But mm. Otherwise, your job is easy, right? Okay. It's not because you are spending that energy yeah. doing what you do and that's because hopefully you're a good writer because you are doing that thing. Okay. It's effort. Well, you know, like... I don't think it's effort. But effort but is practice. not... <laughs> you practice. Yeah, yeah, and you're also getting some little cheeky additional help from the medication. <laughs> you know, like, effort, effort can be also... A com it can come with pleasure, too. If you look at kids playing, you know, sometimes I fetch my son at six, he says, I'm too tired to go do some grocery shopping. But then if you go to the park, then he's, he's going to play for two hours and he's going to sweat. And, and, you know, like he's because 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 this effort comes with pleasure. Yeah. So I think if you are enjoying uh, this, uh, this thinking about my thinking and di diverging from it, it's because you find pleasure in that. Mm. So it means that your abilities are kind of adapted to the level of difficulty of the task you're doing. Because mm. this is when you will get you be in this flow state where you, you, you finish your, your session of writing and you, you sleep like a baby. It's because you've been doing some work, right? <laughs> because it's not easy, but then uh, there's something pleasurable that comes with it. And I hope that every one of you and myself experience that flow from time to time. It's like kind of orgasmic state where we're doing. It's not comfort zone, but it, it comes with uh, other also conditions means there, there is return on the investment, uh, the level of difficulty is adapted to my, uh, to my, and there's, yeah, so it's, it's and there's autonomy, Still level funny. of autonomy, <laughs> and then, yeah, comes this neurotransmitter soup uh, that, uh, that comes in. I will say something that I think both of you would not agree with it. Please, oh, well. <laughs> That's what's you will interesting. Not be able to do that. that when we analyze um, um, what does it actually do in real life, all the work we do on ourselves in our individual sphere. This universal love, you know, like uh, people practicing this uh, ego dissolution and like sp sp spreading love to throughout the cosmos. Well, if, it, if we look at the percentage of implication and engagement of these exact people in the actual things happening to others, we see that the more you work on it in your individual sphere, the less you care about actually what's going on around you because it becomes too violent. And if we look now, it's that like the personal development sphere, sphere is the one that is less vocal about wars and about adversity uh, around the world because they want to be shielded, you know, because they're too sensitive for that anymore. So it's also interesting to see in real life, when I think beyond my body posture, is it making me actually less narcissistic? Is it making me actually uh, uh, leaning towards pro-social behavior? Or is it making me obsessed by my own nostril? What do you call this? Uh, Nombril. Uh, Nave. If I may. Yes. I mean, let's be careful here because we could enter into a huge, big oh, no, no. Well, six week debate. No, no, but, but this is for a big me, one. it's critical to be quite precise about the language and, and the practices. So, 
in a very kind of crass way, the Love and Light Brigade, from my perspective, I also see what I would refer to as a spiritual bypass. Yeah, everything's love and light, but I can't deal with relationships on the ground. I would agree with that. My experience of, of practicing mindfulness, how, how does it benefit? I think we'll meet and we'll join because how it's helped me is in human connection and presence and relationship and deepening those micro moments of connecting to a bus driver or a shopkeeper or a family member or a patient. And the kind of re resilience and the robustness that has come from getting to know my own emotional reactions does increase sensitivity to what others are experiencing. And certainly in mindfulness, the, the whole theory of that is turning towards that which is unbearable. So it, it, it provides us with that capacity to actually really look at what is difficult. Done well, done, done with supervision and guidance from a, a more senior person, but it's that ability to stay with the terror, the pain, what somebody else might be sharing, and then, and, and then from, from there, who knows? But there's at least possibility for dialogue sharing, problem solving, storytelling, or whatever wants to come next. I would like just to uh, go a little bit away and another place. Listen, I ask in my work, uh, I never thought like that, but maybe when I am constructing a character, I am building a brain. And it's building a brain. Yeah. How I can take that under consideration? What I have take under consideration? There is uh, some uh, scar in the brain, yeah. for example, with uh, our past, and how I can at the same time, uh, understand that my characters are maybe also intelligent, also sanguinary as me. Mm. How can I give to the character this uh, possibility? What I would suggest is explore how your character might be different depending on their capacity to pay attention. I mean, you, you mentioned kind of Ritalin, so my mind went to like attention deficit problems. And, you know, absolutely people with ADHD experience and interact with the world, learning, relationships, emotions, in a different way from people who have a kind of normalized attention network. So if you kind of almost had like a, a slider for your character, and you could play with the extreme ends, maybe, you know, what would this character be like if they really had presence? Mm. What would this character be like if they were like, you know, ADHD bumblebee? Mm. How would their experience and their interaction with the story and the other characters be different? And I, I believe this is an important question for our time because there has been a tsunami of ADHD diagnoses, some of which may or may not be related to digital natives and the use of, of the technology that we have. And my belief is that that attention is a primary vehicle for how we experience the world and therefore we must um, really honor it and value it and, and not give it to our devices <laughs> and let people market it and make money from it. You know, this is our most last precious gift that we have for our children. You know, high quality, present moment, non-judgmental attention that ultimately has care as its core foundation. 
Um, so I just yeah. felt quite strongly to say that, but I'll... Sama, how do we get there? So there is a very similar question that was addressed in a letter to Rilke. He said, some, like, when I'm stuck, with what should the character do or what description of his character would be? And Rilke said, well, just go and live. Live, visit cities, fall in love, fall out of love, get hurt, you know, like meet, like just forget about that and go live and trust that your brain will do something about it. He didn't say it this way, but this actually what's, what, what happens is that you will not sit and say, what would my character do? Sometimes writers let us to believe that this is how they work. Maybe you will, <laughs> like Dostoevsky, you know. Used to, but actually, Dostoevsky was a very social person. He was out there, uh, meeting people, discussing his characters with other people. And then the inspiration would come from the default network of the brain that actually stored all this, uh, you know, this this salad of experiences. And you know, instead of of searching, if it's, it's a cooking reci recipe, and you should see, do I put this spice or not? Go out there, mm. go out there, and just live. Mm. The brain is making connections while we sleep, is making connections while we where we go through pain. It's actually learning and unlearning without us even being aware of it. Mm. Jan, I, I can't but think that when Sama says, go out there uh, and, and live and love and that it, it sort of echoes to me what you're saying about uh, if you're interested and involved in something happening out there, I mean in the film, then you lose all consideration for the protagonist. You don't even need him as the center piece of the dramaturgy, you know? And I was thinking, well, is that also an invitation, or does it reopen or open in new ways the possibility of dramaturgies that are not about the hero? What I'm dreaming of is a structural way of storytelling that is not bound to the protagonist. Yes. And that's really a, 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 a very, I've been like working and thinking on that for really decades, and it's really hard to, to, to find a way to, to do that, like, what would be a, a collective way of storytelling of like, and I'm not speaking about telling a collective like a protagonist, oh, right. I'm speaking about structurally changing the way of storytelling. And it's a big, big task, I totally don't know how it should be done, but I, I'm, I'm starting to think about it. Mm. I was also thinking about immersive storytelling. So, you know, how to make the reader the protagonist, and I mean, certainly we have a lot of um, technology now. I mean, I've been involved in some kind of VR and AR related projects which are about how to literally put your body, you know, in the story. It, it's not without um, its challenges and issues, but I think there's a whole another realm of storytelling that, that young people are exploring, you know, which is not yes. words on a page meeting the brain. And I'm, you know, Maybe that's the topic for another <laughs> conversation, but... I will now, uh, yes. would like to listen to, we'd like to hear Toma because I, I, my, my bridge to that is, my experience of osteopathy is, oh my God, I didn't know this was available to me. And it felt like an absolute luxury to be, you know, to be given that sort of, gift and relation to myself through another and uh, I but this is just a uh, maybe a very bad launching pad you can just tell us what you know what this is all yeah it's on. working yeah yeah so um, first of all the main difficulty for, for me is to uh, uh, deal with my own perceptions of what the patient is telling of what I'm feeling because I'm working with my hands, so it's a uh, highly subjective uh, ground. And I always have to go back and forth between what do I really feel? Is it something that I want to feel or is it something that I really feel? Uh, and is this perception different uh, from what the patient is, exper is experiencing? And uh, it's mainly about um, the main factor that we deal with is pain. 
and we have a lot of scales uh, in order to uh, grad graduate the pain and in order to uh, kind of make it easy for us to identify which disease or uh, which uh, trauma can cause a uh, pain. And it's mostly now about the suffering, the experience that the patient ha has. And uh, it's sometimes difficult for us to have that kind of subjectivity towards the, what the patient is uh, feeling. And I uh, also um, sometimes feel that when I'm in pain, I'm uh, far better uh, to, uh, to understand the patient pain. And uh, when it's been a long time that I don't have any pain, it's quite harder for me to see what the pain is doing to the patient. Why is he suffering from something that I would judge as not really important? Mm. And I uh, uh, lately spoke with uh, my wife about it because she's a, a midwife. And she, she said to me that she was speaking with uh, a lot of her colleagues and that they, uh, the fact that uh, her colleagues had uh, given birth completely changed their way of taking care of the, of the patient because they, uh, they, they, they had to do, uh, they had to be in the opposite situation. And to experience it, it's uh, far easy to, uh, to, to deal with uh, my empathy and to uh, quite of uh, understand what the patient is having. Um, but I, yeah, about empathy, I've always told myself, I, it's a question that I have, I don't know if you could answer it, but um, my thinking is that sometimes when the patient is uh, feeling pain or having a problem, um, it's more that I'm trying to help myself helping him. Mm. And it's me that I try to comfort and to, to ease when I'm trying to ease uh, the patient's pain. And I don't know, so if empathy is like uh, selfishness, uh, which is uh, uh, something that would be quite hard for me to, to progress, but I can deal with it. Or uh, if it's really something that I'm trying to do to the patient, that, yes, has the effect of uh, helping me also. Can you maybe just uh, speak about, so, um, because as I know from my own osteopathy sessions, the flow is a very important uh, category in your uh, work, right? Also yeah. the flow of... Uh, the yeah, body, yeah. The, in the body and the blockage and to, uh, yeah, de-block certain um, things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm <not> sure. <laughs> um, that, yeah, but it's something that we have to um, do with the patient. It's not something that I feel. I say uh, there's, no, there's not enough range of motion there or it's too tense there. Or um, I have to uh, put my perceptions into the patient perspectives. So a certain range of motion is normal uh, for a, a gymnast, which is not normal for uh, a normal people. So I have to feel the things with the patients in order to make them also realize that maybe there's something wrong there. And the uh, important, uh, the interesting thing is that sometimes when we touch the body, when we touch a certain zone, a certain area, uh, the patient starts to talk about that zone, um, uh, which is a thing that he didn't have, he didn't do uh, when we uh, were uh, uh, during the interrogation part of the he consultation. Wasn't aware of it. He wasn't aware of it. And just by touching it, I don't know if it's that the patient starts to put his attention to the zone and uh, starts uh, remembering things and talking about it, or if it's uh, the fact that I also investigate the zone that helps it. But it's uh, always a, like a mutual flow that we have to, to have in these relations. And we also can see sometimes that there are variations. And uh, I believe that my job is to do that as little variation as I can. Sometimes when the patients are in a hurry or in very uh, big pain, it's like very chaotic. And we have to flow and ease, ease it. And it's uh, sometimes uh, uh, have the, um, the same repercussions in the body. 
like really big movements, really strong movement when the patient uh, pushes towards you. Or it's really, uh, and uh, with the sound of the voice, I uh, sometimes see that I'm speaking a bit lower, a bit uh, deeper, and the patient starts to ease and the movements come uh, more fluid and uh, it's uh, really uh, uh, a two work uh, thing, two people work thing, yeah. But, but that's presence, what you're describing, you're present. Yeah, sure. Feeling, sensing, responding, uh, alert, relaxed, you know, it's a, a in the service of care sure. is mindfulness. There's a lot of, uh, of similarities with, with the martial arts, with the, the, the foot pressure, the feeling of your balance, your own balance, in order to feel the patient's balance. Because if you're like this, you will not have the same disponibility of, uh, of reception to, uh, to, to your sensations. So yeah, completely agree. What, what, what Thomas was saying also was a direct uh, illustration of what you were des describing, the, the difficulty we have of ascribing to the other the, the same complexity or that, that we do feel. And this, this is, I think, a question that is very relevant to the care uh, sphere, but also to the journalism sphere, uh, to politics and to storytelling. Do I have to feel the pain, to know the pain, in order to talk about it? And you know, in journalism, we call it the death kilometer bias. It's because I, I, yeah, I have more empathy to the people that I know, other people that look like me. You know, that's why Ukrainian refugees compared to whatever. So it's not subject. But then the question is, this is also what led people to talk about male gaze. Is that because women said, no, we do not comb our hair this way. You know, we don't. We, it's because. You, you, you do not feel not only my pain, but you don't feel my, the way I deal with my body. So you, the way you're depicting it is through your own perception, again. And then we can also talk about colonial uh, gaze. I don't know if you've seen The Crown, the last season of The Crown, uh, with, the, with Arab people depicted in a very, um, you know, like a very biased way, where, where we're simple people, we only want Occidental people to like us. But you know, only Arab people actually said, hey, you know, why are we uh, all, always uh, painted like um, th this way? And uh, Asian people say the same about how they are depicted in a very uh, uh, biased and very simplistic way. So do you have to be Arabic and Asian and, uh, and in order for you to, to tell a non-biased storytelling? Again, the question is, can I uh, be, feel legitimate to describe uh, or to talk about uh, certain people's pain or joys uh, if I see them as a group, as dispositions, and not as complex as I see myself and my own group. And my answer would be, again, go out there, meet this, these people, hire them to tell you what they think about your gaze. And this is where also collective storytelling becomes interesting. It's because I, I do not live for 100 years. And I sleep a lot, as a human being also. So actually, the time that I have left for me to understand and apprehend the complexity, it's very limited. So that's why it's interesting to, to actually open up to other people also, uh, also sharing uh, their gaze <laughs> and to let people describe, since we have this empathy bias, uh, let people validate that what you're talking about is actually, this is how I feel it, this is how I... Uh, yeah, I think this is a wonderful way of answering the question of how can stories be everyone's business? You know, how do you make that come about? How do you create that as a writer, for instance? There's a trap where storytellers can fall into. It's because they want to include as many as uh, diverse uh, characters inside their storytelling that sometimes it becomes a caricature of what they want. So talk about what you know. <laughs> you know, I, I prefer not to have uh, um, uh, a gay character uh, or um, uh, an Arab character or whatever. If you are not going to show this character in its complexity, and if it's not a token for you just to say, I check Netflix codes, you know, like, or what. So uh, if, if, I, think, I think the word would be to be humble about 
how much you can get over your own standpoint. And to either be many people talking about it, uh, instead of insulting uh, the, uh, the complexity of, of groups, um, uh, representing them in the, uh, you know, the, the black friend, you know, there is this black friend always being there, but not being the main character, and always being kind and funny, and uh, you know, yes, or the cliches. Yeah. The, yeah, the cliche. Yeah. So, either staying in, and not 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 doing it in an intention to create diverse storytelling, when you're not actually able to really apprehend this complexity. Yes. Uh, yeah, in the same the time, and in the same time, open your story to the thought that you don't understand. Yes. 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 Be humble yeah. to accept that. Yeah. So in terms of, I don't think we need identity politics to like, we have aesthetic, artistic uh, view on filmmaking and stories to solve this problem, I think, because what you're just saying, I would say it's bad storytelling, because it's a shallow character, it's not, it's not good storytelling. And there are some things where you, you need a very good idea to, to do that. Like if I would now do something, for example, like a Spike Lee movie, where only whites would play the black characters in, in I don't know, Queens, I would have to have a very good idea of it. But we can all feel that it feels wrong in an artistic sense. But for example, so now we did a film about Stefan Zweig. I'm the, uh, I, my grandfather was SS. I'm not Jewish, my wife is not Jewish. But we had, I think we had a really good idea about what is exile and what does it mean? And we were telling a story about Europe, but it was set in South America and exile. I think we had a good idea about it. It was a specific idea about this character. Then you can tell as a, as a, a grandchild of an SS officer, you can tell a story about a Jewish refugee. But you need a good idea, I think. Yeah. So um, I, for my taste, I just want to say I totally agree, but we, we have aesthetic uh, you know, uh, categories for that. It's just bad storytelling, I would say. We will <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> gently ask a question to Thomas. Sure. So, like, if you want to have a deeper wisdom in your life, does it come through going deeper into the body or through leaving the body? Both. <laughs> I'd say it's okay. uh, going deeper in the body in terms of perspective or of perceptions, but also to get away in terms of uh, intellect process and to just become uh, the feeling and the sensation just uh, no ideas no uh, what am i going to eat uh, this evening my fridge is empty or all the kind of uh, things that my mind do when i'm a bit tired and uh, just to be a uh, focus on the on the task thank you thank you everyone thank you all thank you